Are you searching for answers? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World. Welcome to our sharing on St. John's Gospel. And I want to um, give you the final testimony of John the Baptist to Jesus. And it's here in the second half of chapter three. It's a very wonderful moment. We see John the Baptist at the highest summit of his life. It's really beautiful. After this, Jesus went with his disciples into the Judean countryside and stayed there for a while and he baptized. Of course, Jesus wasn't actually baptizing himself. It would always be the disciples who baptized. But everybody asks, is this Christian baptism? And the answer is no. Uh, you won't get the Christian era until after the death and resurrection of Jesus, because that's when he inaugurates the kingdom. This is all the preparation time. So this particular baptism is a continuation of what John the Baptist was doing. Uh, in other words, preparing the people for the kingdom of God. Uh, at the same time, John the Baptist uh, was baptizing at Anon near Salim, uh, where there was plenty of water and people were going there to be baptized. So here's Jesus in the Judean countryside and the west side of uh, Israel. And John the Baptist was on the east side of Israel uh, at the, the River Jordan. So they're actually quite a distance away from each other with this is happening. And then uh, John adds, this was before John the Baptist was put into prison. Now, John isn't going to tell you the rest of the story of John the Baptist. You've got to go to the synoptics for that because uh, John won't repeat what's in the synoptics. He doesn't have to. Uh, he's, he's been asked to write a different kind of gospel. Uh, but he just reminds you that this happened before then. And then some of John the Baptist's disciples uh, opened a discussion uh, with the Jew about purification. Uh, and so they went to John and they said, Rabbi, the man who was with you on the far side of the Jordan, that was when John pointed Jesus out uh, as the Lamb of God, the man who, for whom you bore witness, he's baptizing now and everybody's going to him. This is very, very interesting. Here we are at the, the beginning of the gospel and John the Baptist's disciples are saying, oh, everybody's going after Jesus. When we get down towards um, chapters 8 to 12, you're going to have the Sanhedrin saying, everybody's going after them, going after him. We've got to do something about this. But this was John the Baptist's great moment. And he said only what, what a saint and a wise man could say. He said, a man can lay claim only to what is given him from above. This is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. John the Baptist knows who he is. He's the voice in the wilderness. He was the one who came to prepare. Jesus is the Messiah. He's already pointed him out. Jesus is the one from above. John is from below. John has already said, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the prophet. I'm not this, that or the other. Jesus is all that John is not. So uh, John says, look, I can only lay claim to what was given to me. He can lay claim to what was given to him. That's the sign of a very mature person. Somebody at a very early stage is egotistical and wants everything for themselves and is jealous of somebody else doing well. But somebody who has reached the summit of his own life and has spent his life doing God's will and serving God, he can look with joy at somebody else doing well. A man can lay claim 
only to what is given him from above. So John the Baptist was the very one who acknowledged that Jesus was the one who came from God and therefore had God's authority. And then he said to his disciples, you yourselves can bear me out that I said I am not the Christ. I am the one who was sent in front of him. And then he made this wonderful revelation, which I hope I've prepared you for. The bride is only for the bridegroom. And he said, and yet the bridegroom's friend, that's John the Baptist, stands there and listens and is glad when he hears the bridegroom's voice. The same joy I feel and is now complete. So John the Baptist is saying, I prepared the bride in so far as I could to meet her bridegroom. The bride, of course, is the people of God. And I tried to prepare. You're going to hear St. Paul using that language as well in his letters. I prepared you, uh, he says to the Corinthians, uh, as a bride for her husband. Uh, and that's, for, of course, for the, the new covenant, the, the spiritual marriage with God. Um, so the bride is only for the bridegroom. And therefore, John is saying that the claim Jesus can make is that the whole people of God belongs to him because he's the bridegroom just as the father was the bridegroom of Israel. Now, the son is the bridegroom of this new people of God. And if everybody's running to him, that's absolutely fantastic because it means that the new kingdom has already started. And John says, as his friend, as we would say in Ireland, as the best man at the wedding, I'm absolutely delighted. I'm delighted that this marriage is taking place. And he says, my joy is complete. So as soon as he would pick up his ministry, uh, John says, it's now time for me to bow out. And so he says something really wonderful. He must grow greater and I must grow smaller. That's something that you can take out of this chapter, even if you took nothing else out of it. That the Lord must grow greater in all of our lives and we must grow smaller. And the smaller we go, the more he can actually work. And the bigger our ego is, the less he can do anything. And so you have in John the Baptist here, you have the Old Testament uh, quietly and humbly surrendering to the New Testament. And as you know from the Synoptic Gospels that Jesus said that John the Baptist was the greatest born of woman at the time. Uh, and so to have this greatest of the prophets and the precursor to the Messiah say uh, that uh, we surrender and we, we, we let everything go. Everything that was prepared in the Old Testament is all preparation for this. Everything that the prophets have said is all preparation for this. We surrender, we let it go. But of course the Sanhedrin are not going to be of that frame of mind at all. There are actually three musts in chapter 3. One is verse 7, the sinner must be born again of water and the Spirit. To accomplish that, verse 14, the Saviour must be lifted up on the cross before it being lifted up into glory. And the third one is that the believer is the one who must really surrender to God working in their lives and become smaller and smaller in humility so that God can be glorified. It's, it's a lovely thing to have the, what I call the three musts in John 3. So John says, he must grow greater and I must grow smaller. He who comes from above is above all others. The other way to say that is he is supreme. There is no comparison with any other human being. We've dealt with that now all in chapter one. You see, uh, when John gives you something like this in chapter three, he's presuming you remember everything you've been told in chapter one and in chapter two, so that what is written here, you say, yeah, I know that. We've been well prepared for this. So uh, since Jesus has come from God, he is the son of God, he is the supreme one, and no human being can be compared with him. He is above all others. He is the supreme one. And of course, we will learn in the end that he's the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth as well. Um, 
He who is born of the earth is earthly himself and speaks in an earthly way. So John says, I'm down here. I belong to the old covenant. And so I belong to this earthly covenant and I speak the language of the earthly covenant. Now, when you go into the synoptic gospels, you they present John as a person who hasn't picked up the culture that's in the, the, the big cities, that he was kind of rough and ready uh, and that he was quite strong with the people and he would demand and all the rest of it. And the demands he was making were Old Testament demands. And of course, he was threatening judgment on them. And he was saying that uh, judgment was about to come to the house of Israel. And that's why they were expecting Jesus to come in judgment, not in mercy. Uh, and that's why some of the people were confused when Jesus came in mercy and not in judgment. But all of that now is in Matthew's gospel, for example, uh, the teaching that John was giving. So he says, I'm of the earth, earthly, and I, I belong to the circumcision, this physical operation. What he's doing is heavenly, and he's going to give you a new birth. Do you see the way this completes what Jesus said to, to, to Nicodemus? He's going to give you a new birth and you're going to be born of the Spirit and you're going to be a child of God. And it doesn't matter whether you're a child of Abraham if you're a child of God. It doesn't matter what country you come from or what generation you live in. It doesn't matter anything about your, your, your social circumstances or your political circumstances. If you've been born of God, you're a child of God and that's that. So he who comes from heaven bears witness uh, to the things that he has seen and heard. Well, that's what Jesus actually said to Nicodemus when Nicodemus said, we know from the Sanhedrin that you have to be a prophet because of this, that and the other. And Jesus said in verse 11, we speak only about what we know and witness only to what we have seen. So there's Jesus saying, I have been with the Father and I have seen God. I have seen God's plans. I know God's heart. I know exactly what God wants to do. I bear witness to that, which he will continue to do as he goes out through the gospel. And then John the Baptist, you see, being a saint, would recognize this. He who comes from heaven bear wit bears witness to the things that he has seen and heard. And therefore, Jesus knows the truth, the whole truth. And he will say that later in John 14, 6, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, it's true even if his testimony is not accepted. So the testimony that Jesus is going to give as we go along will not be accepted by the Sanhedrin, but that doesn't mean it's not true testimony. And this is verse 33, though all who do accept the testimony of Jesus are attesting to the truthfulness of God himself. Since Jesus is the truth, Jesus is wisdom incarnate. Jesus is the very expression of God in our midst. That when we accept that, we're accepting the truthfulness of God himself. Since he whom God has sent speaks God's own words. This is a tremendously important statement in the New Testament. You won't find it like this anywhere else. To speak God's own words is that Jesus is the expression of the Father. Jesus is the very expression of the Trinity. Now, if there was loads of time, which there isn't, you go back to the book of Genesis and you're told that when God opened his mouth, the word went forth and expressed creation for him. And everything came into being once the word was expressed. And here the word has is being expressed in our midst and it produces the most incredible signs. So he speaks God's own words so we can commit our lives to his words because they're God's own words. And then John says that God gives him the spirit without reserve. This is wonderful. John the Baptist had seen the spirit coming to rest on Jesus in his baptism. Uh, and John the Evangelist doesn't tell us about the baptism of Jesus because it has been done by the synoptics. Uh, but he only tells us about the sign that he actually saw. Uh, now, the Spirit can come to rest on Jesus without reserve because he is divine and human. And because Jesus is one of the three, the Father, 
the Son and the Spirit. So of course the Spirit can rest on him and uh, be there without any reserve. The Spirit can only come into us in a very small way because A, our capacity is very limited and B, we're not all that open. But he was completely open to the Spirit and he could hold the Spirit in fullness. It's really incredible. So I remind you again of Colossians 2, 9, the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelt in him. So God gives him the Spirit without reserve. Uh, and it's therefore Jesus is the one who is the giver of the Holy Spirit. And that's what John the Baptist had said earlier in chapter one, that the one on whom the Spirit rests, he is the one who's going to baptize or saturate us in the Holy Spirit. And then verse 35, the Father loves the Son. Now you're going to hear this a number of times as we go through the, the gospel. Of course, the Father loves the Son. But we use the expression, um, I love you because. You can love a person anyway, but you can have a particular love for them for doing such and such an extraordinary thing. And you're going to hear Jesus saying, the Father loves me because I will lay down my life. In other words, he has a very particular love because of this, apart from the love he has for me. So we're going to hear these particular loves that the Father has for the Son. It's very interesting. The Father loves me because I will do his will. I will teach what he, he wants me to teach and so on. And because of this eternal, infinite, absolute, unlimited, unconditional love that the Father has for the Son, he has entrusted everything to him. Now, any one of these lines that I'm commenting on right now needs an entire commentary by itself because the Father entrusted the whole of creation to the Son. And he has entrusted the whole of redemption to the Son. He has entrusted, therefore, the whole of humanity and all our future to the Son. Everything is through Jesus, with him and in him. Everything, everything. He is it. There is nobody outside of Jesus. It's inexplicable to me that anybody would turn to any other religion for any reason when Jesus is the presence of God in our midst. You alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ. The church says it beautifully. So the Father has entrusted everything to him. So let's make this particular for you and me. My entire being, my redemption, my salvation, my eternal glory, my eternal happiness, everything is lodged in Jesus, everything. I would be a complete fool not to have a relationship with Jesus. He's entrusted everything to him. Our judgment will come from him as well. And the one who will judge us on the, the last day is the person who paid for our redemption. So if I stand before him, having resisted him absolutely, and said no to all his graces, I won't have a prayer because he's the very one who actually paid for my salvation. So anyone who believes in the Son has eternal life. You don't have to wait till the last day to get eternal life. You get it immediately. And anyone who refuses to believe in the Son will never see life. So in choosing Jesus and in entering into relationship with him, we're either choosing eternal life or eternal death. We're either choosing light or choosing darkness. We're either choosing life or choosing death. John is very clear about it. And the reason why the people who refuse to believe in the Son will never see life is that the anger of God remains on them. This is very interesting. Uh, the anger of God means you're still under God's judgment. The whole of the Old Testament said they had to wait for Messiah to get forgiveness and therefore salvation because forgiveness is the key to healing. It's the, it's the, forgiveness is the key to happiness and forgiveness is the key to heaven. And all of us who have joined Jesus and have become part of this wonderful community of his, every single one of us are given an opportunity to use that key for other people. We're all given an opportunity to forgive other people. 
and therefore to use the key to heaven. It's really terribly important. And if we refuse to use this key, we're left outside. If I have a key to my front door and I don't use it, I'm left outside. But I can't blame anybody because I have the key. If I don't use it, it's my own responsibility. So here we have this wonderful testimony uh, that has been given by John the Baptist, and only a saint could give this. And of course, it's not just John the Baptist, it's also John the Evangelist, two great saints. And John the Evangelist knew Jesus and Mary better than all of the other apostles, because John spent so much time with Mary. And so he has this uh, deep, deep, deep understanding of all the issues that are here. So uh, when we look back at the whole of chapter three, what John is saying to you and me is make sure that you have been born of water and the spirit. Make sure that you have opened up to Christ. Make sure that you have accepted his word. Make sure that you are in relationship with him. And if anybody listening to this program is not in that position, for God's sake, get down on your knees and say, Jesus, now come to me. Show me, bring me into this new life. And he will put you uh, in contact with people who will help you. And he will also come to you himself. I want to stop there because I have finished uh, chapter three. I want to thank you for listening. And I want to say to you, Sloan Augsbanach, they live. Goodbye. God bless you. We live in a, a media age, of course, uh, an age in which we get almost all of our information either from television or from the internet. Probably less and less of our information is coming through the traditional print media. So in that context, in today's world, uh, an undertaking like Shalom World is incredibly important. And uh, the efforts to catechize and to evangelize uh, through television and through the internet is incredibly important in the world today. And I'm happy to say that my experience is of Shalom has been entirely positive and I am very happy to encourage everyone who's working as part of Shalom World in their efforts to bring the Catholic faith to the world around us. And also I give my special blessing on all those who are involved in Shalom, all those who are watching Shalom, and all the future viewers of Shalom. So thank you and God bless you.